welcome to Moving the Needle on Wicked Problems. I hope you are as excited as I am to talk to one of Canada's best known political personalities on how he thinks the future of Canada should unfold. We're taking a slightly different approach and talking to one of the best known political leaders in Canada, Mayor Nahid Nenshi from Calgary. Most mayors typically have a lower profile outside of their own cities, but not this mayor. Mayor Nanchi is one that bucks the trend. He shot into the political scene in 2010, winning the mayoral election in a grassroots campaign and quickly became a voice to be heard across the country. Yeah, absolutely, Senator. Mayor Nanchi is a truly political maverick. He has challenged us through his time in office to move past partisanship and unify around wicked problems such as national unity. And since he isn't running again for mayor, uh, I kind of felt that he was a little bit more free to give his opinion on political leaders, on political issues. And I'll also say, Senator, uh, you know, I really appreciated the, the mutual admiration you and him had for each other. So let's get to the interview. Let's get to the interview. Hello and welcome to Moving the Needle on Wicked Problems. Today, I'm so delighted and pleased to have uh, Mayor Nahid Nenshi of Calgary to speak to us. Mayor Nenshi was sworn in as the 36th mayor uh, of Calgary in 2010, uh, a day I, I remember very clearly because that was the day we also swore in, I believe, the mayor of Toronto. Mayor Nenshi became the first Muslim mayor of a Canadian city and of a large North American city. We're going to talk about cities, national unity, politics, love, life. We're going to cover as much as we can with uh, with someone I know you will want to listen into. So just a brief sort of profile for his work. Mayor Nenshi was named a young global leader of the World Economic Forum in 2013 after his incredible stewardship during devastating flooding in, in, in Calgary, McLean's magazine called him the second most influential person in Canada after the Prime Minister. He was also awarded the 2014 World Mayor Prize by the UK-based City Mayors Foundation as the best mayor of the world. So lots of accolades, Your Worship. Uh, but I know that I am curious as others may be, is how did you get into politics? Where did that start from? Oh, it's a great question. And thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, hopefully people will still want to talk to me now that I'm an old about to retire guy. But uh, I'm so happy to be here. And, you know, you and I go so far back um, from the civic action days, from cities and urban issues and so on. And I'm thrilled to have a broad conversation with you today. Now, the problem, of course, is I don't know how we're going to fill the time because both you and I are people of very few words. Uh, <laughs> we're very concise, um, but uh, we'll see if we can do it without people getting too bored. So to your question, you know, I grew up in a family where you were expected to read the newspaper and you were expected to have ideas and thoughts about current events over the dinner table. And so I've always been that. I was president of the Students' Union in my undergraduate degree and so on, and that's always been part of me. But where I got into this is a little different. I am also a professor. I keep reminding Mount Royal University that I'm just on leave. It is the longest leave in the history of the university, but I am still on leave. And I'm a professor of nonprofit management. Ah. And my field really is around two things. Uh, the first is cities and how cities can work better. And that, you know, certainly got me into this line of business. I wrote a little book uh, with a group called Canada 25 and our mutual friend Allison Lote uh, back about, oh gosh, 20 years ago now about the future of Canadian cities. I went back to it recently and went, oh, we're still doing these things. Good. Um, but um, the other piece that I'm really interested in is a civic engagement, how and why people get involved in their communities. And so we actually cracked the code very early on how to get more people engaged in community. The, the literature is very clear. Number one reason people don't volunteer is not, I don't have time, I don't have money, I don't have interest. 
the number one reason people don't volunteer is nobody asked me. And so I spent a lot of time asking people. And in fact, since I've been mayor, I've had a program called Three Things for Canada, which I'm going to take with me when I leave, which is a simple program that we did. We started in Calgary and we expanded across the nation for our sesquicentennial, still my favorite word, in 2017. <laughs> and it's a very simple thing. It just is asking every citizen every year to do at least three acts of community service. And so that's civic engagement. But what I learned is that it's really easy to get people involved in their community. You just have to ask them. But it's really hard to get people involved in politics and in government. And this was a, a this had been a puzzle to me for a long time. How do you how do you crack that nut? How do you get new voices into politics? And so way back in 2009, it was clear that we were having a municipal election. Probably the mayor was going to step down. And I decided that I would get some great candidates. So I spent a year going for coffee and lunch and breakfast with people, corporate CEOs, community volunteers, soccer moms that I was impressed with saying you should run for office. And I struck out every single time. Every single person said no. And in particular, I struck out with women. Hmm. And I always say that I'm very used to striking out with women, but this was different. I couldn't convince a single woman to run for office. And for the reasons that you might expect, people are cynical. Government doesn't represent me. It doesn't matter whom we elect. They're all the same anyway. And for women, the whole system is stacked against me. I have young kids. I might want to have young kids. You know, a question I only ever get from female perspective candidates, I've never had from a male perspective candidate is, how flexible are the hours and how can I arrange school pickup? And you know, in our post-sexist quote unquote world, we don't think about that mental work that women continue to do and have to do and how that prevents women from getting into politics. So in any case, I was very frustrated because I kept striking out. And people kept saying to me, well, why don't you do it yourself? You keep trying to convince us and you keep saying government can be better if we elect better people. Why aren't you doing it yourself? And I was really resistant. I was striking out with myself because I was thinking, well, you know, politicians have to be good looking and charismatic and they have to be able to enjoy kissing babies and shaking hands, never get that backwards and <laughs> puppies and rainbows, all things that I just strongly dislike. I'm just a misanthropic university professor, I was thinking to myself, a nerdy professor who likes to read and write and talk and have ideas, but that's not me. But people kept saying to me, and people who knew me well would say, you can't be a bystander in this life. You can't put, you got to put your money where your mouth is. You got to try it. So I'm a strategist at heart and by training. So I went down and said, all right, can we figure out how a nerdy university professor with a big mouth but no money could actually run and win in an election that is dominated by people who are in the news every day, who are very well known. Because I wasn't interested in joining the race so that people could pat me on the head and say, thank you for elevating the debate. Thank you for being brave and putting your name forward. Now, nah, if I was gonna do it, I was doing it, I was in it to win it. And so ultimately, almost as a thought experiment, can we improve elections and politics in addition to improving government? We did it. And here we are 11 years and three elections later. Right. And, and I remember very clearly uh, when you won in Calgary because Toronto had just elected a new mayor, Rob Ford, and we were green with envy. In fact, there was a word that was coined in Toronto. It's a we have an envy. Uh, and, and so the comparison between Toronto and, and Calgary is, is, you know, sort of comes top of mind. And whereas Toronto is really known for its diversity, Calgary is not, although we know that Calgary is, you know, uh, as diverse uh, as, as other places in Canada, especially large urban centres. What is it? What should Canadians think about when they think about Calgary and Alberta when it comes to diversity. Why is it that we think about Calgary in one way and that one way is, you know, the stampede and cowboys and oil and gas, you know, yeah. all of that. Well, we don't you know, listen, I've just come from an event at the stampede and I just doffed my cowboy hat and I have very bad hat hair 
as we're having this conversation, because that is a part of who we are. But there's a way more to it than that. And, you know, I always was bemused when uh, I was first elected, because you're right, that first trip to Toronto was nuts. I think I did a speech for you that first trip to yes, Toronto, as I recall. You did. You did. And, um, you know, I couldn't walk down the street without being mobbed and people were shocked that I did things like take the subway. And I was like, well, how else do you get from Union Station to Young and Eglinton quickly, you know? Um, and uh, and it was a bit crazy, but, you know, people kept saying, oh, this is the new face of Calgary. And at the time I was 38 years old and I thought, well, this new face of Calgary has been around in Calgary for four decades. I was born in Toronto and I spent much of my 20s there, but I'm really a Calgarian. And so that was always perplexing to me. I think it took a year for the Globe and Mail to stop mm. calling me Calgary's Muslim mayor and just calling me Calgary's mayor. Yep. And, you know, even now that I've announced my retirement, you know, so much of this is going right back to this diversity question, which I don't mind. But I think that, well, there's, I'll say two things about it. The first is, it's part of a broader knowledge gap that we Canadians have about one another. It's not just about diversity, but it's about the fact that we don't really know each other. And we don't understand how different people live. So yes, Calgary is nearly, well, it is one in three people in Calgary are non-white now. It's closing in on 40%. Um, it's a remarkably diverse place. The neighborhood I live in, in Northeast Calgary, you know, looks like Brampton. It looks like Surrey. And people probably don't realize that. And, you know, yes, there is excellent dosa here, right? But there's excellent everything here, just like in Toronto. Though I do think the Thai street food scene in Toronto is a bit better. We're working on that. Um, but there's a broader question here. So, you know, I was on um, the election night panel last November, or last October, whenever the election was, on CBC. It was a giant panel, and I was seated at the kids' table and trying not to be bitter about it. But... It was very clear that the main panelists were talking about Alberta and the West, because obviously that was a big story in the election, in a way that betrayed no knowledge of it. And so I actually muscled my way in, probably never be invited on the CBC again, but I muscled my way in and just said about 30 seconds uh, over the whole evening. And last I checked, that 30 seconds had been viewed almost a million times. What did you say? All I did was explain the perspective of people from Calgary, which is that for many, many, many years, Calgary and Alberta have been the source of funding for Confederation, the economic heart of the community certainly, but also by far the largest differential between funds into the federal government and funds out. And my premier loves to complain about it and say equalization is unfair, but in reality, most Albertans are sort of proud that yeah. we're kind of the big brother and we can look after everybody else. But then things changed very suddenly. So Calgary went from having the lowest unemployment rate in the country for many, many years to the highest in under 18 months. Calgary went from having no downtown vacancy, you couldn't get an office in Calgary for love or money, and skyrocketing rents, to one third of the glittering office buildings in Calgary right now are empty. That happened in 18 months. Yet, because of our wealth and prosperity here, um, we still are the biggest net contributor to Confederation financially. But we feel like suddenly we've been helping out for so long and now we need a little bit of help and no one's paying any attention. So I'll give you a very simple example, which is Thanks to a lot of lobbying, and, I, and I, I don't take credit for a lot of stuff, but I'll say a lot of lobbying for me and the mayor of Edmonton, the federal government put in a program during COVID called the Rapid Housing Initiative. And it was about taking advantage of the fact that vacancy rates are high and you can hotels are in terrible shape financially, so we can actually buy existing <laughs> buildings for affordable housing. This was an Alberta-born idea. Because the point I was trying to make is it won't work so well in Toronto or Vancouver, but in Calgary with a relatively modest infusion of cash, I can end homelessness in the next 18 months. So the federal government took our idea and they implemented it. And then they allocated the funding. 
and Calgary has 8% of Canada's homeless population, and we got 2% of the funding. And this happens all the time. And so this is where you can see that that level of frustration comes from. But it's the same in the opposite direction. We don't understand Toronto very well. We certainly don't understand Quebec very well. And so part of this whole conversation for me is not just about racial mm -hmm. divisiveness, which is a big issue. You know, and we, I'm sure we'll talk about how we need to move from a place that is pluralistic to a place that is anti-racist. But it's also about all the different divisions that we allow ourselves to have in this country between regions, between wealth strata, between ages, between races, between communities. And this is really coming to the fore as we're trying to tackle this COVID pandemic crisis together. Uh, and we've got to figure out how to move forward in a way that we solve the most wicked of all wicked problems, mm -hmm. which is what I call the eternal question of humanity, which is how do we live together? How do we share this land? You have gone on record recently saying Canadians need to talk to each other. We need to get to know each other better. I saw an, an article by you. And and no one could disagree with with that notion because you know especially now with the covid crisis at times we we don't behave like a nation we behave like you know 13 disparate provinces and territories uh, so how do we actually talk to each other is it you know do you see a national conversation that is god knows not led by government but led by civil society and if so who, how do we, you know, so put some meat on, meat yeah. on this bone for me. Sure. National conversation is such an Ottawa thing to say. We need to yes. get you back to downtown Toronto <laughs> um, or to Calgary, even better. I know it sounds naive and it sounds hand wavy to say we need to talk to each other. But for me, it's actually a very strong call to action. So let's start with people who are lucky enough to have a microphone. Let's start with government. Let's start with policymakers and business leaders, but especially government. And let's turn that mirror on ourselves and say, how can we do better? How can we be better? Because when we turn off Canadians with our ridiculous childish behavior, when everything, everyone is an enemy, unless they're in your party, when no one from across the aisle can ever have a good idea. Then what message are we sending to Canadians when we can't actually stand behind doing what's right because it's not poll tested or it might help our opponents out? What message are we sending? You know, my premier is not a bad guy, but he's having an enormous amount of trouble trying to figure out what he believes in. <laughs> and whether what he believes in is, in is in conflict with what he must do. So we've got to somehow get to a world where ideas triumph over ideology. And the way to look, one place to look for that kind of leadership is in municipal government. Because, you know, in most provinces in this country, except Quebec and British Columbia, we don't have political parties at the municipal level. Everyone is an independent. And even though we're seeing increased partisanship on municipal councils, including my own, by and large, we actually have to listen to one another. And so, you know, even though I've got on my council, everyone from Mother Earth will save us all to Trump Party of Canada. <laughs> most of what we do is unanimous. And over COVID, we've settled into a pattern where if it's not unanimous, it's usually a 11 to 3 vote. And of the, there's three that, you know, or whatever, but the other 11 are a huge range of political philosophies, ages, backgrounds, and they figure out how to get along and they figure out how to get the best idea forward. And they may be doing it for different reasons. Just this last week, we made a, a really significant commitment, both financially and morally and ethically to rebuilding downtown Calgary. And indeed it passed. 10 to 3 because one person was ill and wasn't able to be there, but it would have been 11 to 3. And 
you know, there were some people in there who did it because they felt that this investment was the right thing to do for vulnerable people. There were others who did it because they felt it was the right thing to do for business. The point is it was the right thing to do. And yes, it's a big investment in the arts and culture. And the right wing people saw that as an economic development tool and the left wing people saw that as a good thing in and of its own accord. But ultimately everyone agreed it was the right thing to do. So what lessons can we take from that as we think about how to run our own business? Like, look, I haven't watched Question Period in years because it's gross. I'd much rather visit a kindergarten class. Thank you very much. Um, yet, somehow in the bubble of policymaking, we think that's the world. We think that's life. We think if we can get off a bon mot mm -hmm. or a little slap, you know, that's the way to go. Let me let me criticize somebody. I'll criticize somebody straight up here which is our Minister of Canadian Heritage, who's someone who I quite like, who's a thoughtful person, on Earth Day published a tweet showing the leader of the opposition wearing a shirt that says, I love Canadian oil and gas, and him wearing a shirt saying climate change is real, and said, caption this. And my caption was, yeah, both of those things are true. But why'd you do that? What was the purpose of doing that? Was that just a smug little put down or a smug little gotcha of the other side? What purpose does that serve? How does that move our conversation around the critical conversation we got to have around energy and the environment and how we move forward as a nation, how we solve energy poverty while uh, addressing our impacts on climate? How does that move that forward? It doesn't, but you got a bunch of likes and you felt good about it. That's not leadership. So I'm wondering if you have, you know, you're, you're talking about essentially leadership being the ones that pull either people apart or people together. Uh, it's either a dividing or or something that rallies around people. And I just wanted to follow up on the sort of, you know, that oil and gas because, you know, I've been in politics now for, you know, over a decade myself and, and as, as a political staffer. And, and one of the most divisive issues that we have is, the environment, climate change, oil and gas. You know, on, on one hand, you know, being from Ontario, uh, people want action on on climate change. Uh, Quebec wants action on climate change, uh, and then we think, uh, on the other hand, that Alberta doesn't necessarily want to have any action on climate change. But it's not. That's not obviously true. It's just how do we bridge that sort of gap that exists, especially when you know, from a perspective of Albertan. I would think that, you know, they're threatened, you know, livelihoods have been created, they're threatened about the future. So how do we, how do on that particular issue and then, you know, can we, can we divide the, the, you know, bridge those divides? Look, we've done this to ourselves because it's not true that Ontario doesn't like oil and gas or Alberta doesn't believe in climate. People believe in both of those things. Mm -hmm. And I believe extremely strongly in two things. Number one is, giving people access to safe, clean energy is the most powerful poverty fighting tool we have in the world. And that as a country that is blessed with natural resources, what we've allowed ourselves to do, which is to sell a non-renewable resource at far below the world price, is the height of idiocy. And the only way to fix that is to get access for Canadian energy to world markets. For whatever reason, we've created a world where our most important export in the country, which dwarfs all other exports, because remember, it's not just Alberta livelihood, it's Canadian livelihood, right? We wouldn't have any of the wealth we have. We wouldn't have universal childcare without the Canadian energy sector. It's our largest export and we've created it so we've only got one client. And our one customer or our one client is now also our biggest competitor because they've taken technology largely developed in Alberta to create to exploit their own reserves in a way that we haven't been able to do. And so we've created a huge morass for ourselves. But you talk to the average Canadian and you say, do you hate oil and gas? And she will say, not at all. Yeah. Do you want to reduce your own emissions and Canada's emissions? And she will say, of course I do. And we can do all of those things. But this demonization of one another on both sides you know, when the mayor of Quebec says there's no social license for a pipeline, I say, is there a social license for tankers from Venezuela going up to St. Lawrence? You know, again, this doesn't really show leadership. Look, I wear the color purple every single day. I've worn it for 11 years. 
And people are still shocked 11 years in when I point out the reason I wear purple every day is not because it brings out the color of my eyes. It's because it is red and blue. Because I believe that we are political creatures as human beings, but we should not be defined by our partisanship. We should be defined by our humanity. And, you know, people keep ask, asking me, oh, you know, now that you're leaving municipal politics, you're going to go into federal or you're going to go into provincial. And my answer always is, why would I want such a demotion? But more important than that is, where is the room for purple? Where is the room for us to be able to actually work together to solve problems? And I don't think that's a Pollyanna-ish thing to say. I don't think that's a naive thing to say. I think that for many decades, we had a broad political consensus in this country on things like the benefit of immigration, on things like diversity and pluralism, on things like good Scots uh, frugality, right? Um, or I prefer to say good South Asian frugality. <laughs> and those broad, and, and yes, we disagreed on motives, we disagreed on paths, we disagreed on how to get there, we disagreed on the percentage of debt as GDP. But we broadly shared the outcome of the kind of community we're trying to build here. And I'm just not sure that's true. Oh, no, I shouldn't say that. It's still true. If you got Aaron O'Toole to write down and talk to his iPhone and get Siri to repeat it back, what kind of a country he wants for his kids, and you got Justin Trudeau to do the same thing and you didn't know who said which, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. I'm sure of it. But they sure don't act like that every day, do they? And so to me, there is something to be said as a voice in the woods speaking out for decency and civility and solving problems together. Um, and nowhere more than on the energy and environment file. Climate change is real. Climate crisis is the defining challenge of our generation. But you don't solve it by turning off the taps. You don't solve it by creating energy poverty and you don't solve it by impoverishing the country either. You solve it through ingenuity. You solve it through things like the hydrogen economy, figuring out ways that people can still have access to the energy they need, while vastly reducing our impact on the, on the land, air, and water. There are solutions. But we, we can't get to them if we're talking past one another all the time. Is there is there sort of a structural change that would need to have? Like, how do you create the purple party as well? I mean, you know, in the, in the sense of, a, you know, sort of a post-partisan community, but is there structural changes maybe in the way that we vote, like proportional representation as a possibility? How do you see structural changes to make this happen? I mean, yes, maybe. Maybe we do some of the stuff around democratic reform, uh, better voting systems. You know, we remain one of the few countries in the world that has a first past the post system. Maybe we do really esoteric things about how votes are done in parliament. But I actually don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is in people more than in structure. Because, you know, even over the 11 years that I've been in this role, the partisanship and divisiveness has gotten much worse. And I have many, many theories on why that is or what happened or what led to that. Um, I have many theories on how social media as promise was ruined so very badly. But ultimately, it's a I don't want to say it's a recent phenomenon because that division and hatred has always been there, but it hasn't been as evident. It hasn't been as much on the surface. That is a recent phenomenon. And if it is a recent phenomenon, then we can go back. Oh, gosh, we can make Calgary great again. No, I don't like that slogan because um, <laughs> it's already great. We can keep Calgary great still and we can keep Canada great still. But we can create something better. The world the way it is today is not the world we're stuck with. So I, I take your point on hyperpartisanship, uh, and you know I I was never a politician until I was called to the Senate, and I've experienced that in in stunning ways. And perhaps I was a little naive, uh, and it is surprising uh, that no good idea gets by the barriers of partisanship, and it, it's it's actually really easy to get sucked into that, and and so I take hope always from what happens locally. So, you know, I, I, I think, especially when I'm in despair about what's happening in Ottawa, I take a look at how my community is working. You know, local always gets 
the yardstick moving. So I want to ask you about cities and, you know, Jane Jacobs said famously one time that uh, the level of government furthest from the people is best positioned to protect its rights. The the but and the level of government closest to the people is best positioned to deliver services to it. Given what we now know about uh, the right seeking agenda from the people. Do you think cities need to re take a different position on being the protector of rights of the people who live in the cities? Yeah, you know, it's an, that, that's an interesting Jane Jacobs quote. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly our different orders of government have their own roles. And the joke that I've been making for 11 years is I can never quite remember what it is the federal government does. <laughs> they have all I the money. Um, and they do, you know, defense stuff, border stuff. Um, I shouldn't Monetary say Monetary stuff. Yeah. We really, really know what the federal government does. Um, but it all lands on the cities, doesn't it? It all lands in your neighborhood. So we can have in the vaunted chambers in Ottawa, deep discussions about people's rights. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's in your own neighborhood, whether you feel where you find, whether you feel comfortable walking and you're wearing your hijab or not. And so this last year, you know, we went through a lot. And, you know, I'd really be interested in your perspective on this, Senator, because you have been a, f a tireless fighter for minority rights for your whole life. But when we were going through this conversation, look, I have been, for the last 11 years, one of the biggest cheerleaders of the notion of Canada, of the idea of Canada. The night that I was elected in 2010, I suddenly found myself super famous. I was on Time Magazine and CNN and Al Jazeera and you name it. And nobody was interested in my amazing campaign or what I thought about public transit or the future of cities. In fact, they weren't even all that interested in the color of my skin. I think I'm the first non-white mayor of any major city in Canada, but no one ever says that. They were always just interested in my faith. Ah. And at that moment, I thought to myself, you know, I could just wave this off because it really wasn't an issue in the election. I had a choice to make. And I actually chose to tell my story a lot because I thought it was a story that the world needed to hear because even then in 2010, I could feel these increasing waves of intolerance and division and hatred in the world. And I thought, let's talk about a place that works, a place where diversity works and multiculturalism works and pluralism works. Let's talk about Calgary and let's talk about Alberta and let's talk about Canada. And of course, things have gotten much worse and much worse. Uh, in the latter half of my political career. But last year, with the Black Lives Matter and Indigenous Lives Matter movements, I went through a lot of conflict in my own brain. I've been a cheerleader of this diversity. And yet, and yet, there are so many people who are going through so many things in our community where they don't have equal opportunity. They don't have the right to live a life of dignity. So last summer we had anti-racism hearings as many cities did at City Hall. Because the stampede was canceled, we had a bunch of time on our calendar. So we had several days of anti-racism hearings. And my white colleagues were, I think, quite shocked at the things they were hearing. And on the surface, I was not at all shocked. But then I thought about it more deeply and I said, why is it that a young black man today is telling me about getting harassed by bouncers at a nightclub when my best friend had the same stories as a young black man growing up and I'm not young anymore. So 30 years later, why is this kid going through the same thing that me and Shima went through when we were kids? Why haven't we moved forward? So I'll tell you a little story. In the middle of all of that, I had the opportunity to speak to some grade 12 students at Western Canada High School. It's one of the best public high schools in the country, in the heart of downtown Calgary. These kids have limitless opportunity. And 
we were just supposed to talk about whatever you talk about in social studies, being the mayor, the orders of government and all of that. But of course, all they wanted to talk about was racism <laughs> and how it impacted them and what that meant to their lives. So I tried a little experiment. And I said, hey, how many of you just got your driver's license? And, you know, millennials and Gen Zs don't get their driver's license the day they turn 16 anymore, but a bunch of them had. So I turned to one of the kids in the class and I said, tell me what your parents told you when you got your driver's license. What lecture did you get? And he said, well, I was told that I can never speed, that I can't have too many friends in my car, that there's zero tolerance for drinking and driving. There's zero tolerance for texting and driving. I have to put my phone away before I get in the car. I can't connect the Bluetooth. And if I get a scratch on my dad's car, don't bother coming home. And I said, okay, I got the same lecture when I was 16. And I bet everybody who got their driver's license got a variant of that lecture. And I turned to one of the non-white kids in the class and I said, tell me about the lecture you got. And I heard exactly what I thought I would hear. Well, I got that. But I also got, never keep your wallet in your pocket. Always have it on the center console where it's within easy reach. Ah. Never reach into your pocket if you're pulled over. Never argue with the officer. Even if it's super unfair, we'll deal with it later. They ask you to get out of the car, get out of the car. Never, never resist. These are kids in downtown Calgary in Canada. And they live a different life than their classmates. Still, even now. When most of us see a police car, if we're walking down a shady street, we feel safer. These kids see that police car and feel less safe. And so I've been really struggling with this. And the way that I've tried to articulate it is to say, look, those of us who grew up here as members of a minority, especially immigrants, we have a deal. Sometimes we talk about it explicitly, sometimes it's implicit. But our parents made a deal, and they made a deal that impacts all of us. And the deal is this, we'll put up with it. <laughs> we'll put up with it. We'll put up with the security guard at the Walmart giving us an extra eye, never mind that he's from the same race as we are. We'll put up with a different way that we interact with the police and with government. We'll put up with always having to be a little bit better than the other person because we have to prove we weren't there just before because of our race and we'll put up with it and in return we get to live here we get to live in the best place on earth we get to live in a place of limitless opportunity we get to live in a place where we're valued and i think for a lot of young people they're saying i don't want that deal yeah. that deal doesn't make sense for me anymore I want to be valued and respected on my own terms. And so for me, the way that I've bridged this gap is I've said, look, it is possible to hold two contradictory thoughts in your mind at the same time. And that is that we're very proud of what we built here, that we're very proud of diversity and pluralism and multiculturalism, but also that we have a lot of work to do that we have to be able to go from a place that strives to be not racist to a place that strives to be actively anti-racist. And I don't know what that journey looks like. I have no idea. I know it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be uncomfortable. And a lot of us who have privilege, regardless of the color of our skin, are gonna have to ask ourselves some real tough questions. And it's going to be very unpleasant, but I think we have to get there. But I started by saying, I want to know what you think about this. That's what I think about this. But Senator, you've done this work on the ground for a lot longer than I have. And I wonder if you're starting to feel the same things. Well, I definitely feel that we have to go beyond the aspirational, performative elements of uh, of what we say about diversity and inclusion to move to move and move towards some of the harder work. My fear is that this entire conversation that we are convulsed with, I, I, I kind of think there are two pandemics that we are facing right now. One is the, the 
very much the known pandemic of, of the virus and what we're going through for health and safety and security. And the second pandemic we are facing up to is a slow understanding by many Canadians that racism has been a part of our life. My fear is that it's flavor of the year. And yes. this is my fear that it that all this talk will die down before we do the hard work of changing, you know, attitudes and behaviors, but more explicitly institutional policies uh, to move us along. And that's my fear. But there's also an opportunity. So I'm grasping at it. And I want to ask you is. I'm, I'm a hopeful person. I mean, what, when you are an immigrant to Canada, Nahid, you will appreciate you have to be this. optimistic. You, you have, have no to be choice. optimistic. You have no choice. You have to be optimistic. I'm optimistic that we will make strides. I don't think we will ever. You know, eliminate racism from the human psychology because it is so of much part not. of. Yeah, but we will make strides. We will make improvements. Are you hopeful? I'm so optimistic. And the reason I'm so optimistic and the reason that I don't believe this is flavor of the month or flavor of the year mm -hmm. is because of those young people. They won't let us. They won't let us be complacent. They won't let those of us who have had lives of success and privilege as immigrants and as non-white people say everything's fine. They're going to continue to push us. And here in Calgary, you know, I am so very proud of my police service because they have actually acknowledged the history of institutional racism and policing. They've acknowledged the need to change. It's really hard and not everyone's on board, but they've acknowledged that they can be and do better. Heck, they defunded themselves. I think the whole concept of defund the police is a silly uh, yeah. distillation of what we're really talking about, which is building a better system. Mm -hmm. And so I never, I always say, don't talk to me about defund, talk to me about fund. My job as mayor is to go find money. That's all I do all day, every day. And tell me about the system we need to fund of better mental health support, of better first response, right? Of better training for our women and men in uniform. But my police service actually said, here's some money. <laughs> We're going to give money from our budget to help develop this new system. I didn't even have to ask for it. And so I think that there are enough good people with enough good intent that this will not just fall by the wayside like some other social trend. It's too important for that. We're certainly hoping uh, that it doesn't. And, you know, there's all kinds of movements building. There's a Black Caucus in Ottawa, for instance. And, you know, I'm just talking at the national level because I live in the belly of the beast. And, and those movements are, are really important. But again, uh, you know, uh, we need people like you to continue to uh, urge us forward with optimism, but with self-awareness as well. I think uh, the the sugary narrative of Canada th that we all buy into, you know, diversity is our strength. We are our biggest multicultural, most successful multicultural country in the world. We may be that, but we have a lot of work to do. What causes you to stay awake at night? Well, right now the pandemic. Uh huh. And what I will say is that this is the most challenging time for us all. It's the most challenging time in the public health pandemic. We actually have here in Calgary and everywhere five simultaneous crises. The first is a public health crisis caused by COVID-19. And it's bad right now. Let me just open brackets and say it's bad. You know, just before this, I did a press conference at which I pointed out that the infection rate in Calgary right now today is more than double the infection rate in India. In India is at the top of every newscast about how awful things are. Of course, the scale is much different. There's way more people there and their healthcare system has collapsed, but there but for the grace of God, our healthcare system could collapse too. This weekend, we actually have put out um, triage policies for doctors and nurses to use when determining who gets a ventilator. Right, so this is dangerous stuff and and we're not that far from the precipice, but there are five crises, not just one. There's a public health crisis. There's a mental health and addictions crisis. 
that's been always been there, but it's been exacerbated by COVID. And, and the thing I'm most proud of in my work in the last few years is the development of Canada's first community-based action plan on mental health. Uh, the third one is, of course, an environmental crisis. The fourth one, of course, is an economic crisis. And the fifth one is this conversation we're having around what it means to be truly anti-racist. And we're dealing with it all at once. But sometimes you got to prioritize. And at the moment, at this Thanks. exact moment in time, public health, I, I mean, we got to keep people alive to get them better. Yeah. And that's the, really got to be our big focus. The public health crisis also has an underbelly of race in it, as, as you well know. Uh, Not certainly anymore. So this is the most state. interesting thing, oh. right? Because so I live in Northeast Calgary, which last year had a higher infection rate than any country in the world. And it was too easy for people to see this as a them problem, as an othering problem. And even uh, some some people were suggesting the reason that infection was so high in Northeast Calgary is because of South Asian tradition, because we have multicultural families. And I sort of went, yeah, no, nobody here is picking up strangers at the bus stop, inviting them for chai and samosas at home, okay? That's not what's happening. What's happening is my neighbors have to go to work Right? They are providing the services that are keeping us all alive and fed and safe. They're the frontline healthcare workers. They're the grocery store clerks. They work in factories. They drive truck and buses. So they have to go to work. And we failed at protecting the people who have to go to work. And we live in a society where those people are often racialized people. And the reason I said it's different now and the statement I'm trying to make now is here's some good news. Northeast Calgary is no longer, well, it is again, but for a few weeks there, it was not the highest infection rate in the, in the city. The problem is everyone else is caught up. <laughs> it's not that we've done better, but these variants are so prevalent that the whole city is ridiculously high now. But I want to remind everybody, and I'm getting very, uh, very flourishingly rhetorical today, and I apologize, but there's a whole segment of our society that we don't think about. And so here's the person that I was reminded of at the beginning of the pandemic, who I had forgotten about. She gets up very early in the morning and she takes the bus and she gets to work early at the long-term care home where she wakes up our grandparents, cleans them up and gets them ready for breakfast. She works through lunch. But because her employer doesn't want to pay benefits, she doesn't get 40 hours a week. So then she takes the bus to another long-term care home across the, across the city and does the same thing again yeah. for dinner and putting people to bed. She finally gets home after her 14-hour day, still no health benefits, to look after her parents who live there, as well as her kids. She's a racialized woman. She's a recent immigrant. Where is she in our decision making? Where is she in our policy discussions? Why are we so quick to blame her? How dare you work at two different long-term care units and spread the virus when we've created the system that forces her to do that to get food on the table? We live in one of the most fair, most just nations in the world. But is it fair and just for her? And are we complicit in creating that system that gives us comfort and ease and has our grandparents and our parents well looked after? But at what human cost? A society is made up of decisions. We decide what's important. We decide what we're going to fund. We decide what we want to prioritize. And when did we stop prioritizing these people? So as I as I hear you speak, and, and we're coming almost to the end, unless Paul has a question, but I'm going to pose, I, I cannot imagine that someone with your passion for this country, your experience, your ideas uh, that of bringing people together, of holding our country together and build, I cannot imagine that, that you will not be on the, on the scene, on the political scene one way or the other. So I'm going to ask you, do you have plans? And, and you know, 
I, I cannot imagine you going back to the sedate life of a of an of an academic, although many academics are not sedate anymore. Uh, but we can't not have you in politics, Mayor. Where do you go from here? I have no idea. Um, you know, this is very tough for me because I remember I'm a strategist. I pride myself on knowing what the four next moves on the game board are. And I've actually given myself the freedom of saying, I don't know. So Siri tells me that I've got about 150 days left in this job. I've got a very, very long to-do list and I intend to tick off a bunch of things because nothing focuses the mind like a deadline. And after that, I don't know. I'm being open to the universe. So there's a word that you know, of course, that every Calgarian now knows because I never stopped talking about it. And the word is seva. Mm -hmm. So in South Asian languages, seva simply means service. And seva is my oxygen. And I have been telling Calgarians now for 11 years that every one of us must strive to be seva dari, someone who gives service. But that doesn't just mean someone who gives service, it means human being. So long way of saying, I will find a way to serve. I'm not going to sit down and shut up and you know, ensconce myself in a corporate boardroom somewhere. Oh, there might be some corporate boardrooms in the future, but that's not going to be all of it. Um, and certainly on these issues of what it means to be anti-racist, I intend to make my voice heard in some way. Right now, I'm looking forward to figuring out how to do SEVA outside of elected office. I'll never say never. Yeah. You never know uh, if that political bug will hit again. But for now, uh, I'm very excited about the exploration. So, so, so I just want to add, if you don't mind me, just quickly jump in on a question um, just before we go. Um, you know, we work in politics where, you know, we help as best we can to to deal with policies, to craft policies, craft ideas, you know, for an anti-racism future. What are, say, some of maybe two or three of the building blocks that are necessary in your mind to build that anti-racism future? Is it is it data? Is it you know uh, people you know diverse backgrounds having been in part of decision making? Is it is it all of those things? But are there a couple building blocks that you see? Let's start hour two now of the podcast because <laughs> that is a, that is question. such a big and such an important question. So let's start with this question of data. I believe very strongly in evidence-based decision-making. Maybe I'm a rare politician that way. And so for me, it is extremely seductive to say we need to calculate much more race-based data. We've been too polite and too shy to do that because we need to understand how different Canadians are doing. But there's a reason we don't do that. And that's because activists and people who were interested in that, in that a decade or two ago told us to stop doing it because the data was being misused, because the data was being used to justify over-policing in minority neighborhoods, for example. And so that's why we don't do it. And so, yes, I think we need to do it. I think we need to do a lot more data collection, but I think we have to be very careful with how those data can be used. I think that we just have to ask ourselves a super basic question. In the city of Calgary, one in three people is non-white. Why do I have so many all-white boards of corporations and nonprofits? How does that happen? How is it that the senior management at the city of Calgary, extraordinarily public servants all, my top 50 managers, do not include one person in a, there's some people in acting positions, but does not include one person in a permanent position who isn't white. How does that happen in a place that has such a diverse workforce? I so, think it you know, happens because we allow it to happen. That's right. Because we allow no it to happen. No one's being a jerk. No mm. one's saying you can't get mm. this job because you're not white. No one's being overtly racist. But is it because you speak with an accent when you present to Calgary City Council? Does that unconsciously make us think, mm, maybe you're not quite as good as the person next to you who really does a better job when they present to council? Maybe. Right? These are the things that we've got to stretch out. So from, from the Calgary perspective, our anti-racism action plan basically has three planks. 
Number one is we're a big employer. You know, I've got 15,000 colleagues at the city of Calgary. So we must be the vanguard anti-racist employer. We must look through our recruitment and our promotion and make sure that we're actively anti-racist in that work. Number two is a focus on policing. You know, we it is time for police reform, and I'm not one of these, you know, radical person who says defund the police. I have enormous respect for the women and men in the Calgary Police Service who look after us every day. But at the same time, if you're having a mental health crisis and you phone 911 and you get police, fire, or ambulance, which do you pick? Can we create a system that says police, fire, ambulance, or mental health crisis? And you have a different uh, type of service that you receive. So getting that piece, policing and first response rate, right, is really important. And the third piece is a broader community piece, which really is around bringing anti-racism into the hearts of people in the community. I mean, it's very interesting right now because I sit on many boards of public and nonprofit organizations, and maybe I never noticed that I was the only non-white person on the board. But I will tell you that as we get into the spring, which is traditional board recruitment process time, every single one of those boards has put equity, diversity, and inclusion at the top of their list of whom they're recruiting. So sometimes change happens very, very slowly until it doesn't. It doesn't happen. And I feel like maybe we're in that until it doesn't moment. So I want to shift my last question from the political to the personal. Tell me about your family and how they came to Canada and how that whole experience played out in your life. I've heard you speak about it and it's a and the you know I'd like our listeners to to experience that as well. So my family are Ismaili Muslims, a minority within a minority within a minority of South Asian descent, add one more minority, who generations ago moved to East Africa, another minority. So we know about being minorities, but our community in many ways thrived in East Africa, but never integrated into the community which was the downfall of the Asian communities in East Africa, in my opinion. And so my parents were living in a town called Arusha in Tanzania, which is at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro. Then as now, they worked in a hotel. And then as now, Arusha was a place that was used by lots of international organizations for peace talks and treaties and lots of other international kind of work, which still happens. And I went to visit there for the first time as an adult uh, just a few years ago and realized the reason that it's used for all these purposes is because there's a mountain on one side and a jungle with lions in it on the other side. So if you're at the peace table and you wanna walk away, there ain't nowhere to go. <laughs> you gotta come back to the table and keep negotiating. But there were a number of people there from the former Canadian International Development Agency. And they used to get the Toronto Star sent to them in their diplomatic pouch. And for those listeners under the age of 40, the Toronto Star is a newspaper. A newspaper <laughs> is sort of like an iPad only on paper. And so when they were done reading um, the Star, my dad was always a voracious reader. So he asked them if they could have the paper. So he'd read the Star at night. And he learned all about this country on the other side of the world. And what he was really taken with was the pictures of the brand new city hall in Toronto. I think if dad had had the opportunity to have an education, he might've been an architect. And he was fascinated by this building and how it could be round and so tall. And he said, you know, someday I wanna go to this Canada, to this Toronto, and I want to see that city hall. And so some years later, he had the opportunity to represent the whole big family at his sister's wedding in London, England. And I think it was the first time he ever got on a plane. And so before he and my mom went, she realized that she was pregnant with me. And they decided to go anyway. And they left my sister behind. I always say to my great regret, they later sent for her. But they... <laughs> They left her behind three years old with family and they went off to London and dad thought, you know what, since we're traveling, we may as well go to Canada. 
they didn't have Google Maps then. I don't think he knew quite how far London to Toronto was. And so they did. And they arrived in Toronto on a warm June day in 1971. And he saw that city hall. And what follows after that is a very typical Canadian story. A story of sacrifice, a story of seva, of service. Ultimately a story of some success, though also a story of a lot of hard times. I always say that sometimes we were poor, sometimes we were very poor. But ultimately, I got to graduate from an outstanding public school. I got to explore the city that I love so much on public transit. I spent my Saturday afternoons at the public library. I learned to swim not very well in a public pool. I now run the public pools and they don't like it when I say I didn't learn to swim very well. But 38 years later, just shortly before he passed away, my dad got to sit in a different city hall thousands of kilometers away from the one he always wanted to see. And he got to see his son sworn in as mayor. What a wonderful story, Mayor. What an absolutely wonderful story. They you must. Know, the thing about it is it sounds extraordinary. But what makes it extraordinary is how ordinary it is. Yeah. It's a story that repeats itself on the streets of this city and every street city in the country every day. Mm -hmm. And the secret to that story is one thing, which is that I grew up in a community that had a stake in me. Whether it was the friendly librarians or the public school teachers or the poor swim instructor, even though I would never get it. I grew up in a community that wanted me to succeed. And ultimately, I don't care if you're left wing or right wing or no wing. The country we're building is a country where every kid deserves the right to succeed where every kid deserves the right to live a great life, a life of dignity and opportunity. That's what we need to keep building. So thank you so much, Mayor. That was a wonderful chat. I could frankly continue talking to you, but there are time limitations. But let me put this one final idea in your mind to chew over in your next 150 days. Think about the Senate. Come and be my colleague. <laughs> because together there is in we, fact an Alberta vacancy yes at the moment. there is and <laughs> I, I know I know that you would so. shake us up all for the better thank you so much mayor and thank, thank you, you thank you thank you thank you to both of you for all yeah. of your service to this great nation God, thank you to our listeners there's you know this podcast will blow your mind but we have other podcasts coming soon. So please stay tuned and send us your ideas about who we should reach out to next to feed your, your, uh, your imagination and your uh, aspirations for this wonderful country and in fact for this globe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.